Buttered at the Shitter. And also, Dave is here, but you can't see him. He's in the background, but he might chime in. Uh, but we have, for you guys, live from the Shitter, new products to talk about and a big announcement. So I'm just going to kick it over right to Jason and let him kind of take over from the start here. So what's new? What's going on, man? Oh, boy. I, I know at least some people are wondering. It's like, well, how come you didn't go to Can Jam New York? And why did you cancel last minute? And why did you say it's so busy? And why is this? And why is that? So <clears throat> I'll start with an anecdote. Um, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I were with friends in Japan. And we actually went to a place called the Yamanashi Wine Cave. And uh, that's where you could actually go and drink a bunch of local wines. Um, and by a bunch, I mean like 300. And uh, by, you know, uh, by, you know, a bunch, I mean you could drink all of them. They basically give you a cup and you, uh, you go as long and as hard as you want, <clears throat> which is really interesting. I don't think I'd try that here so much. Um, but that's not the anecdote. The anecdote is the, when we were there, the mayor of the town, I think it was the mayor, it was a little fuzzy by then, actually held the place open about half an hour after closing, which if you know Japan, that, that just doesn't happen. Uh, but he was fascinated by uh, my friend Ken and I, we were drinking wines and we were commenting on them and writing down things and apparently we seemed knowledgeable, so he was interested in, you know, how the heck did we find it, what did we think, etc. And as the evening went on a little bit, he, he said, well, where are you from? And he said, no, let me guess. Uh, said Ken, to my friend Ken, who was born and grew up in Oregon, he said, you're clearly from Los Angeles. Huh. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's nice. You know, he's, he's actually you know, wearing a plaid shirt, dude. But anyway, and he looked at me and he said, well, and you're clearly from Texas. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, I'm from L.A., man. I'm, I'm not from Texas. Which uh, kind of brings me to the point. You know, I was mistaken for being someone from Texas. And now it looks like uh, I am going to be someone not just half from California and half from Texas, but we are committing to expanding in Texas. And some of the craziness has been in buying another building in Texas to expand to, uh, the repairs and upgrades on that building, uh, actually a bunch of techno you know, technology stuff that we're working on uh, you know, kind of came to a head at the same time. We are selling our house, our personal house in California and building another one in Texas. All this is happening at the same time. So all that stuff kind of went nuts right around the New York can jam, which is why I didn't make it back. Um, and that's my way of saying that, yes, we are expanding in Texas. Uh, we should start producing what we call the large products, uh, the ones that actually have power cords and, and internal transformers uh, by midsummer at the, at the earliest, late summer at the latest in Texas. And we'll be winding down uh, California a bit slowly, uh, probably, but probably by the end of the year. Uh, we will be a Texas company. And I know there's probably going to be some questions about that and probably some opinions about that. And I can definitely answer all of those. Um, so I don't know, if, uh, Brian, do we have any questions about that yet or comments about how we're crazy going to uh, you know, a, a crazy hot state where everyone carries guns? And <laughs> Drives Ford F two fifties. I was gonna say, have you bought a truck yet? I think is yeah. the first question we should address. Well, here, here's a here's the interesting um, uh, dichotomy for you. Yeah, did did you buy a truck? But did you also did you buy a cyber truck? Because those are actually made in Texas. Too. No way, they're made there. Yeah. They seem like yeah. the most uh, Los Angeles yeah. West Coast car ever made. I know. Uh, it's made in Austin. <laughs> yeah, it's made in Austin. So no, I have not bought a truck yet. Um, uh, I don't have a hat, um, I don't have boots, uh, oh, yeah. I do, I do not have a belt buckle, but I understand, you know, that would be a, you know, you, you, you should probably earn the belt buckle. Well, come on in if you want. Um, the, uh, so I don't know if I, I qualify as Texan. In fact, if, if, if I ask our Texan friends, you know, when do we become a Texan? They, they just laugh and go, oh, never. Um, I, I really think there should be a, a Texification, you know, th program or a, 
a Texas naturalization thing. It's like, <laughs> uh, can you name you know some of the people at the Alamo? Do you know the significance of Goliad? Do you know the Texas Pledge of Allegiance? Because that, there's a separate one. Um, you know stuff like that, and then maybe maybe you could actually get your little Texas card or something. Um, and for the Texans out there, yeah, I know I'm making fun of Texas. It's all right. I make fun of California all the time, too. Because both That's states true. are crazy. It's just one's this way, one's that way. Yeah. And it's fine. Uh, we like Texas a lot better, and actually, uh, my wife is the one dragging me there. Um, I was like, well, you know, we can continue going back and forth. But she's like, I like Texas a lot better. Let's, uh, let's pick, a, you know, pick a state. And so we did. And uh, now everyone can say... You know, well, that that's crazy. It must be for cheap labor. It must be for this. Or must be, uh, and it's not. It's none of that. But uh, I'm sure I can answer some of those questions. We have um, one of them is a comment that says it's not as bad as you think, and some of our <laughs> wine is bearable. Can you attest to that? I am drinking a wine from Invention Cellars, uh, actually just outside of Fredericksburg, uh, called LB Left Bank, Left Bank um, which is quite good and. I'm very excited that we're going to uh, have a house that's you know only about 30 minutes outside of Fredericksburg, mm. um, as well as the house in Corpus. Corpus, our Corpus uh, facility will continue. We will be uh, continuing to make the uh, the Walwart powered products and USB powered products there, and then we're going to be making the larger products in a facility uh, on the north side of San Antonio, uh, which we're in the process of procuring and then uh, ret you know, actually retrofitting to what we need. Uh, but I think that's also a, a, a good distinction. In California, we were always, you know, we would lease. We, don't, we didn't own anything. In Texas, we own our facilities. We're, you know, we're investing for the long term. And we're actually kitting them out exactly the way we need rather than it's been a little ad hoc here. Uh there's a good question that someone asked, but I want to ask you this other one that I find equally interesting. Can we call you Boss Hog now? <laughs> no. And I'm wondering if I can recall this 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 mention. Did he say something like Roscoe P. Coltrane? Yes, and he, he did. had like a hat and the whole. Yeah, he did. I don't know if he was. Was he Texan? I. I, I this is something yeah. that's from my child. This is like 40 years ago at least. You're talking about uh, what was it? What was the name of the show? The Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. The Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. But it must have been, yeah. So. Yeah, okay. And then a serious question. How is this affecting your suppliers in California? Will you still be using some of them? That's a great question. And um, because I know that some people are like, oh my God, you're abandoned in California. It's actually not so much. Um, our metal uh, all comes from California. Our transformers, the vast majority of them come from California. And uh, now probably about eh, 20 or 30 percent of our PC boards uh, come from a company here in California. Uh, PC boards may end up shifting a bit, but everything else is, you know, we've established relationships and unique processes for both of those. Uh, you can't just pick it up and put it down elsewhere. And so we're going to be continuing to work with those suppliers in California. In fact, just had a meeting with them a little earlier this week about the logistics of like, Okay, how do we do a full truckload of stuff, you know, rather than a bunch of less than truckload, you know, things, you know, over the year to keep the keep the cost contained. And then <laughs> where do we put it in the warehouse, which is a whole nother thing. Um, just to break it up one more time, someone said you should maybe put longhorns on the hood of the Corvette. I second <laughs> that motion. Most of the other questions we have now are pertaining to the new products that you kind of mentioned oh, yeah. in the post. So if we want to shift gears over to that, we can always come back to the more off-topic su subject. But I think, if I recall, I got it in front of me here, you mentioned two new products uh, that just came out that you can answer questions about. If you guys have any questions, I'll uh, ask Jason here in the studio. The new products uh, are the long-awaited Azure 2. Yes. And the surprise, maybe, Valley 3. I don't know if that was something that everybody kind of had been talking about beforehand, but the Azure 2 and the Valley 3 are the two most recent products that came out. So is there anything you kind of want to talk about blanket statement for the, those products? Um, both of them have been kind of surprisingly strong. Um, you know, we have you know, 
every company has its favorite products, which are not necessarily its best-selling products, but they also have their best-selling products. And you, you kind of know, like, if we're going to do a Vidar or a Freya or something, if we did a new one of those, they're, they're going to do well. You know, they're a, you know, they're a top seller. Uh, Azure and Veily have always been kind of steady, but not exciting. But they have seemed to have gotten a lot more traction with the, with the new releases. So they're actually do both doing well, uh, better than we thought. Um, and we've started the second run of, of both of those, which surprises the heck out of me. Because um, Veily, like I said, used to be very steady. Um, I think it's partially because... They both are fairly significantly different. I mean, mm -hmm. Azure 2 is is different. You know, it has twice as many output active output devices as uh, as, a, as the old one. It will source twice as much current. It doesn't go into protection as easily. It, it works you know with a much larger range of speakers, and it's got that shiny new Halo thing, which I I know we have other questions about, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but it, it's that one's done very well. Um, the Veli 3 is the first inexpensive tube amp we've done with a, mm -hmm. with a really good, solid 100-volt you know, rail voltage on the tube, uh, which allows us to make it more linear, get more dynamics out of it, um, you know, and actually reduce the amount of overall feedback, uh, which, is, which is pretty nice. And so it actually sounds a lot better than the old ones. Um, so they've both been doing very well. Also, I, the, the Veli 3, it, it really does debut um, some of the, the very custom sheet metal we're doing. Uh, I, I mentioned the guys in California. We have custom stuff, custom processes that people can't replicate. That chassis was a hell of a thing to get right. That's stamped out of one sheet. It is not milled out of a solid hunk of aluminum. It's not, you yeah. know, it's not stuck together. It's one sheet, and they stamp it, and it's done. Very efficient, allows us to keep the cost down. Also, you know, if you know, if you consider essentially the impact, you know, environmental impact of this, we're not producing a pile of shavings this high to make one, you know, tiny product. That's great if you have like a aluminum smelter, you know, next to your, you know, aluminum, you know, machining facility. But no one has that in the U.S. It just it doesn't happen. So we take a sheet of aluminum, it's already done, you hit it once, you grain it or you spray it, and it's finished. So it's really efficient and keeps costs down. Um, someone brought up, I know you mentioned uh, compatibility with Azure 2, but someone brought up four ohm uh, yeah. uh, speakers. Would you consider that to be a pretty good pairing with the Azure 2 still? And, and the, can you speak any, I guess, to the flexibility of the amplifier? and? Yeah, I mean, any, any of our amps, if you're going to start, you know, putting them in mono and then, you know, running four ohms, you know, maybe you might hit protection, but um, a stereo Azure in the four ohms shouldn't have any problem at all. Um, in fact, one of the tests we did while we were uh, essentially tuning the protection system on it was, I think we took about four pairs of, uh, of the little ELAC uh, Mm -hmm. Speakers, which I think are nominal, six ohms. And Very demanding speakers, Yeah, I feel like. Yeah. We, we took four pairs, paralleled them up, and then hooked them up to like one Azure and one Vidar just to you know, see what the, what the subjective level was. Because you know, we can set it at you know, 31 amps, or we can set it at you know, 40 amps for 100 milliseconds. or what, But what does that really mean, and, and what happens when yeah. you actually turn it up? And it's shockingly hard to get the, either of those to go into protection hmm. as a single amp. Uh, any updates on singularity? Singularity uh, may be delayed a little bit. We'll see. Uh, we may push that till next year just so we can do a little bit more work on it. Um, it's running well as, as far as you know as far as uh, you know performance goes, but you know. Who knows? Right now we're evaluating a Gunier 2 that is multi-bit and a Gunier 2 that's singularity. Uh, it is entirely possible you're going to see a multi-bit Gunier 2 that's a bit different than some of our other uh, multi-bit implementations out there before you see singularity. So uh, it'll become much more clear <laughs> mid-summer you know, why we're delaying it. It's just we have another big kind of technology announcement that uh, we want to concentrate on. And I, I can't talk about it 
Uh, no one's even hinted about it, so there's no information out there at all. But interestingly, it is one of the two things I mentioned, you know, our, our fans brought us two ideas mm -hmm. that were really good. It's one of the two. And it's really probably the most important thing we've done, um, you know, at least certainly in the last five years. Um, do you guys have any future plans for the Saga S? Interesting. <laughs> How many Sagas do we have left? <laughs> uh, I'll just go ahead and say, it. yes, uh, there will be another Saga coming. Uh, it will replace both the S and the Plus. Uh, it's not imminent, but give it a couple months, um, and we will have a new Saga that uh, is not only less expensive, but actually offers a lot more features, and has still got all of the, the good stuff, relay ladder, etc. So anyway, I think everyone will be pretty happy about that. But in the meantime, we do have some uh, Saga Pluses, so uh, if, you, if you want something with a tube, get it now. The new Saga 2 will not have a tube, and there won't be a tube option. Any preamp product updates? Is, is the future of Freya Plus secure? Yes, it is. Actually, it's now one of, for a while, last year, I was, we were, actually, Brian, we were commenting on this. It's like, uh, the, last year, you couldn't give away tube products, uh, or so it seemed. Uh, it fell out of our top 10 list, and yes, we do keep a top 10 list. It's, it's horrible, yes, but we do have to sell things, and it's interesting to know what it is. Now, it's been trending uh, from number two to number five on the top 10 list, which is way the heck up there. So... No, we're not going to be making any significant changes to Freya Plus. And yes, it's going to continue to be made as long as we can possibly make it. There is a question about the uh, Iggy DAC, but I want to go back to one of the questions someone sent in earlier, um, which was, why did you continue? We were just talking about products that make it yeah. and products that don't. What happened to the Iggy, the Yggdrasil Plus OG? Why did you discontinue that? Mainly because the DACs are really, really expensive. Mm. Um, they went when we started doing them. Uh, the the original eighty fifty seven ninety one was in the realm of uh, sixty dollars each. It uses four of these um, wow. per, per Iggy. Uh, now it's I think it's one hundred nineteen, one hundred and twenty each. So we would have to raise the price of the Iggy pretty significantly and honestly it seems like uh, people are more excited right now about the more is better the the redone you know more is less so that it actually sounds good uh, and less is more is doing well and I mean if you really want some with 805791 we still have a ton of garage sale twos which are 805791s um, and those are the cheapest diggy you can get right now at least until they run out which will probably be Late summer? Maybe late summer? We'll see. So. We have another question that is, would the Halo technology improve the tiers and or the Ragnarok 2? It wouldn't. Uh, you know why? Because they're, uh, they're differential. They're balanced differential. Mm -hmm. Both outputs are active. And actually when you start trying to implement something like Halo in that, in that case, it becomes feed forward. You can get away with some feed forward, but uh, feed forward uh, is is not <laughs> it's not so conducive to good uh, stability uh, in an amp. So we played with it and decided that actually a lot of the benefits of Halo uh, are also given by a differential both sides active configuration, which Tier and Ragnarok both are. Same with Jotunheim. You know, same with anything that we're calling balanced or differential. This one's being echoed on both platforms, Facebook mm -hmm. and YouTube. Is this place closing? Is the shitter here in Newhall closing? Great question. I should have uh, covered that. The shitter in Newhall is going to continue until we have a plan for a shitter in Texas. Um, then, yes, it will be closing. Our lease is, is uh, coming up, uh, you know, as in ending. And it seems like uh, the, they really want to bring this back to more of a 
you know, wine tasting place, which is what it was uh, way back in the day. And they, they have some people that are interested in that. So we have to close this anyway. Uh, but right now it's like the question is, what do we do with this in Texas? Uh, we've talked a, a number, number of ideas, uh, including, you know, doing something fancy, you know, in San Antonio, like at the Pearl or on Riverwalk or something mm -hmm. that might not be exactly what we're doing or partnership in some, you know, funky area near there, or maybe even putting it up in Austin. Um, uh, they, that's a little harder to manage and, you know, someone would have to actually supply it, uh, you know, uh, up in the Austin area, which will be, which would be more of a pain. But all of that's kind of on the table, and we won't close this up until we actually have a, at least a plan. Someone's voting for Houston. Mm. Um, I like this question. Would we ever see another release of the Folkvanger headphone amplifier? We could do it. Um, I think we're still too little low on tubes to, mm. to do it right now. But it, there's nothing keeping us from doing it other than tube supply. I'd have to see what we'd, what we'd be able to do with that. It does bring up uh, Van Halen 3, though, which I did mention to people. And I'm surprised no one's asked about that yet. Is the Gumby 2 still, quote unquote, slated for summer release? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Together with another surprise product. Any huh. more niche collabs? Because I think there's this, this gentleman's referring to maybe oh, yeah. the, the Mr. Audio. Speakers, yeah, Dan Clark Audio. Uh, no, actually, uh, I think he, he's probably talking about like the Pietus Maximus and, mm. and Magni Piety, stuff like that. Mm. Uh, or if he's talking about Dan, it really, it really comes down to, you know, well, with Dan, it's like, is he interested in doing something else? Um, if he is, you know, we're definitely up for it. If, if other headphone manufacturers were interested, I'm sure that we'd, you know, we'd be up for that as well. Um, within reason. We don't, we don't need to be everything to everyone. Um, if you're talking about uh, niche audio, uh, the, that also really kind of depends on, on what they want to do because you know we were happy to actually help them get started and now it's, it's really a question, what does Christian want to do? Um, if he'd like to work with us, that's great and if he's got other plans, that's also great. Would you, have you considered making a Lear Plus type amp with relay ladder and stuff, but without all the tube stuff, maybe make it balanced? That's really, really difficult to do in that size. Okay. Uh, it, if you wanted a Jotunheim size amp that did not have cards, it's probably barely doable, uh, but maybe not. I haven't thought about it really. Would Singularity cards be possible for Yggdrasil? I would think we could put it in pretty much anything we wanted. We could, we could go up to Iggy, uh, Gunyar. I don't know about, what do you think about uh, Bifrost Day? Would it fit? <laughs> I don't know if it'd fit. Piggyback cards or something? Oh boy. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't really fit. Got it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe not Bifrost so much. We'll see. I'd, I'd love to... You know, I'd love to see where we could take it both up and down the line uh, because I have heard an Iggy prototype with a Singularity um, that sounds really good. But uh, Any updates with that tube preamp I think you talked about in the last live stream? Two, oh, oh, I'm sorry, the tube, tube phono, phono preamp. Two phono preamp. Uh, the update is I'm, I'm lazy. Uh, it's just... I only finally just got the metal drawings out, so it may be a little late, but you know, late summer is not impossible for that one. Uh, that one, that one could be really a very interesting product on a lot of levels, um, but it would be uh, fully capable of doing doing moving coil levels of gain, you know, six, well, 60 dB anyway, okay. uh, without step up transformers or anything. That's just pure tube gain, and that's a you know, passive, passive style RIAA type preamp. Uh, so it could happen. We'll see. <laughs> you know, again, a lot will become clear probably around July uh, when we do this one big uh, introduction of interesting products. Is a bigger or more complex of version of the SIN coming? Any products focused on multi-channel? I wish. Um, 
personally, you know, Sin sells okay. It hasn't sold enough to really mm -hmm. you know, merit much more um, focus on it. I like the mm -hmm. way Sin sounds, but I do understand that you know, people would like to have a bigger version. And you know, I've, I've done some prototypes, but nothing's really gotten full, fully baked yet. Um, and in fact, if you look at, the best way to look at it might be as more of an add-on product uh, to a preamp. So you, you know, start with a car or you start with a, a Freya uh, and then add that on to do the, the derived, you know, channels or something like that. Or we do it in digital. Dave, you know, showed me a prototype of, you know, uh, surround running, you know, digitally. And no, not Dolby Digital, but our own proprietary digital stuff. So there's a lot of options, um, but nothing's clear yet. Have you ever considered tube rectification for products like the Freya or the upcoming tube phono amp, or ideally a theoretical bigger amp along the lines of Wu or Saiyan? No, I, I don't understand the benefits of it. So if someone wanted to enlighten me on the, the benefits <laughs> of it, I mean, other than another tube. Uh, we, I, we got pretty far into this one without this question, but I, I still appreciate it. Any updates on the gadget? Oh, the gadget, yeah. No, we're, we're actually working on it and making progress. Uh, it's just, that, that one will be a real shocker when it comes out. That's all I'm going to say right now. Uh, it's not going to be this year, but it's going to be a gigantic shock to your system. Okay, the new Valley 3 is able to power the power-hungry Modhouse Tungsten, which is a great feat. Mm -hmm. Is the is shit keeping the tungsten in mind when designing future amps? I never used that headphone, um, so uh, I think we always kind of keep in mind stuff that's hard to drive. It's interesting that you say the Valley can do that because uh, it's one of the, our weaker amps. Hmm. Um, I think I got an email from a guy who said, "Oh, it does like you know 25 to 27 volts peak into the you know tungsten load." Uh, you know, which is quite a feat, and I'm like, well, that's easy. I mean, a Magni will do that. <laughs> and basically, anything above a hell, you know, Mag, yeah, Magni will do it. Bailey will do it. Literally, every every product we make will do it. So if that's the bar, um, then all of our products will drive tung the tungsten. I like this one, but I'm not even sure what the answer might be. <laughs> Would you ever consider a tube monoblock amp? You mean like actually driving speakers with output transformers? Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, we, okay, if we're not making the transformers, uh, we're just buying someone else's transformers uh -huh. and putting them in a box. I mean, anyone can do that. Uh, I, I don't see any interest in that. I'd much rather, if I want to, you know, you know, get on my soap, you know, my soapbox here. Um, I'd much rather actually keep uh, the class AB or, you know, high bias class AB linear supply amp alive because mm. there are a shockingly few number of companies making those now. Mm. Almost everyone's doing, you know, either switching power supplies or class D or both. And um, indeed, the, yeah. And if you're talking, you know, a class AB or class A linear supply amp, I mean. You're talking a pile of cash, you know, or you're talking us, uh, or there's a couple other companies. I honestly, sorry, I mean, I can't keep up with everything, mm -hmm. but the, the options are very small. You, you may know some of the other companies that are doing this. I, well, I do find it interesting that you bring up Class D because of all the options out there, the one that seems to be getting the most headway into the audiophile mainstream, at least of the shows, maybe not with the head fight crowd, is Class D. Mm -hmm. Gallium nitride, the, any, we've talked about this on a lot of different shows, but I still think it's worth merit. Do you ever consider doing a Class D option or no? We would always consider it. It's like a few years ago, I you know, asked Dave to take a look at it, and I think you took it kind of beyond the current state of the art. Uh, I about 10 years ago, tried something. Yeah, doing some. But with gallium nitride. Yeah, and what it sounded like. I, it was playing in a room, and I didn't go in the room. I just kept walking. <laughs> uh, that's okay. It, another soapbox. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll get I'll get up on my soapbox. This is not to shit on Class D. This is just to talk about our 
prejudices in audio. Um, I think a lot of what we hear in audio, uh, it, it comes down to if it's an unfamiliar type of distortion, if it's unfamiliar, if it's an unfamiliar fuck up, let's just put it like that, it's a lot easier to gloss over it. Mm -hmm. and, and, gla and class D right now is kind of unfamiliar. It doesn't sound like class A. It doesn't cl sound like class AB. It doesn't sound like continuity. It sounds like something else. And so until you actually kind of key on you know, the characteristics of class D, it's hard to, it, it's harder to reject it. I, every class D I've heard, um, and I have not heard all of them, is kind of dead sounding, kind of weird up top, um, but it's hard to get a grasp on it. A bad class A B amp, like you know, it's low bias and you know, high feedback. Those, those sound horrible. You know, um, class A, real class A, has its own sound, which uh, Milner, you know, Milner three, retaught me. You know, when I when I really took a listen to that, I'm like, this is. This is doing stuff that you know I haven't heard from any of our amps, but that's because we didn't do a real single-ended class A with like a choke backup, and uh, so we're going to try to keep the older ideas alive and maybe even resurrect some of the even older stuff and see how that goes. the The market will determine who wins. What? Um, this is very interesting. The have you never done a three hundred V amp? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use big tubes. Oh. Okay, yeah. Someone was asking about it, but I don't recall you ever doing one. But it is a very, very popular one with speaker enthusiasts and even headphone yeah. guys too. But yeah, that's a bit curious. You just—it's the size of the tube that doesn't interest you, and the... it, it's just that if you're going to drive speakers, uh, you have very few choices in in tubes. If you want to do a direct, you know, if you want to do a direct drive of speakers. You're going to be using a ton of 6AS7s or a ton of mm -hmm. 6C33Cs, something like that, uh, in order to get it down into the realm of being able to drive speakers. And it'll be, you know, it could probably do it, uh, but it's going to be hot and inefficient and painful and etc. Um, the the big the the big uh, you know power power tubes like you talk, 300Bs, uh, the KT88s, things like that. Those you use with transformers. And again, you really gotta ask yourself, what's the sound? Is it the tube or is it the transformer? And if I was like an old school transformer master who had you know, wound tons of transformers for tube amps you know, for years and year, decades, you know, then yeah, that makes total sense. So I can say, this is our transformer coupled tube amp with our transformer, mm -hmm. which is different than anyone else's. Now, if you're gonna go out and buy a Hammond transformer, Throw it in a box, a fancy looking box with 300B and charge a billion dollars for it. It's like, that's not interesting. It's a Hammond transformer. It's going to sound like a 300B hooked up to a Hammond transformer. It's fine. Now you can go to Hammond and you can probably have them do the custom transformer. Or you can go to MCI and have them do the custom transformer. How good are they at transformers? Don't know. They may be able to come up with something great, but we can't really say that it's, it's ours. Mm. Um, and, you know, I would want a transformer expert you know i'd want to actually have that it's like if you look at uh companies like manly labs I right. mean, they wind their own transformers yeah. they are experts at this mm -hmm. you know their stuff is going to sound different and their stuff is going to actually reflect you know their expertise in transformers i can't say that we have any other than we can order transformers that typically don't catch on fire and don't hum very much so <laughs> I've been um, holding off on a single question to see how much fever pitch I can raise in the chat, and I think it's working. There's um, an enormous amount of concern about, will you please speak about the possibility of Valhalla 3? There we go. There you go, guys. Yep. I asked. <clears throat> you can stop typing or type more. I actually don't care. I like to hear you guys. So whatever you want to do. For everyone who wanted a, like a less expensive folk monger, uh, that's a little bit more sane. It'll we'll probably like the Halo 3. Right now, it really comes down to getting the transformer right. We're still having transformer problems with that, as in it runs hot and it physically vibrates. So we're, I'm supposedly getting another prototype here shortly. Mm. If that works, then it can proceed into production. 
so that would be another summer product. Perfect, you know, nice hot running tube. That's right, yeah. To, to throw out at summer, but yeah, we are working on it. I would like to. I would like to actually have um, a interesting tube amp that's not you know nearly two thousand dollars. What else do you guys have? Ask. Uh, please ask away. We got the Valhalla three there. I'm, I'm trying to go back through this, but all I see is Valhalla 3 over and over again, maybe 30, 40 times. We talked about the gadget. Let me tired of... Well, I can say that we had a uh, Valhalla 3 metal prototype that after I got done adding holes to it, it probably weighs about a half pound less. It's, <laughs> it, needed, <laughs> it needed a lot of ventilation. It's, it's, a, it's a very toasty little lamp right now. Uh, would you ever do a discreet Manny? Oh, I'd love to do a discreet Manny. Um, and it's, uh, that's a great question too because it, you talk about the trade-offs. Um, a discreet Manny, like say a single-ended you know, single version of Skull or you know, a specifically single-ended uh, you know, product that actually had the same type of topology, you know, where you actually have a, dis you know, a dis discrete implementation, but then a passive RIAA. Um, it's doable. It can actually perform at a higher level uh, than ICs. Yes, I see designers. I can beat you. That's not a problem. It just takes a lot of parts. Um, the question is, where do you, where do you draw the line? Hmm. Um, it, does it make sense to have a a uh, discrete Manny that might have 200 or 250 parts in it and costs a lot more and gets it up near the skull level, you know, or is it better to go with the tried and true, you know, the OPA 1612 uh, implementation of the Manny, which sounds quite good. Um, I don't know. Uh, if I could get the parts count down um, and keep the performance up, that'd be great. But the problem with discrete is you're typically going to throw a lot of parts at it. And uh, we did actually, I believe Mike might even have a prototype of a discrete Manny I did a long time ago, before Manny 2 even. Um, but that was, a, that was a really weird one. With, like, it was a really, you know, it was a complimentary feedback pair, input stage, a bunch of paralleled stuff, and then kind of like a Magni, you know, out for a second. And it, anyway, yeah, the, the short answer, Doable, probably not same. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, do you have a price point in mind for the upcoming Phono tube preamp? Expensive. Expensive, guys. For us. Um, no, no, that means twenty, thirty thousand, right? You said audio. You said audio file expensive. Divided by fifteen. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, it might. It might be up there at eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars at the worst. Um, you know, hopefully a little lower than that. We'll see. Someone's asked this before, but I actually can't recall myself of this exact product. Have you ever thought about producing something like Sweet Vinyl's Sugar Cube One? What's that? Are you familiar with that product? <clears throat> no, I mean, are you? No. No, I don't know that one, guy. Sorry, I'm. Uh, is there still a chance to get the OG Yiggy card? No, we don't have any. Let's see, what do we have, guys? Uh, did you talk uh, about um, the Valley 3 enough? Did you address that? Because I know we talked about is your 2 Val Valley 3 covered yeah. well? Yeah, Va yeah, Valley 3 is a great little product. I mean, that's what I have on my desk with a, a Muddy Melty bit. Is the Heretic version of Magni ever going to return, or is that chapter closed by now? Yes. Closed, closed out. I like that way to work in the book, guys. If yeah. you guys don't know, is there a copy? Jason does have a book. There's a book here somewhere. Oh, uh, anyway. Not in this room, surprisingly. But yeah, way to work the metaphor in. I appreciate that. Uh, you can still buy one. They're on the site. They're $59. We're closing them out. And then we should have enough left to probably get through summer. So, yeah, we have a lot of them. But uh, uh, beyond that, no. No, we're, you know, we're about discrete stuff. Uh, except for Manny. So now you're going to make me do a discreet Manny. <laughs> oh, believe me, every oh, time, I, every time I, I see some op amp that's like, you know, five bucks or seven bucks or nine bucks, I'm like, you got to be joking, right? You know, but the thing is that the, it will eventually be a wash. You know, you throw enough parts on a board, it's going to cost that. 
Uh, plus, it takes up a lot more space, as Dave always reminds me. It's like, I don't know if that'll fit. It's like, eh, try hard. <laughs> Except I'm getting to the point where my stuff doesn't fit anymore either, man. <laughs> <clears throat> Did you ever consider having the bottom section that's gray be black or silver to match the top? Um, I think we're going to stick with gray. We, we actually did one that was silver, uh, like the top, uh, by accident. It looked horrible. Black would be interesting. Um, but yeah, I think we're just going to stick with the gray. So apparently, if I'm understanding this correctly, the Sweet Vinyl Sugar Cube is the device that digitally gets rid of clicks and pops. Ooh. This sounds like a Mike project or a, D a Dave project. Dave doesn't look excited. Yeah. Why you, yeah, guys, you can't see him, but he doesn't, he's shaking his yeah. head no. Why are well, you not excited? It's been a long, long time, but no. Since I heard him last, but you, you get just guessing, I guess. So we made a, okay, we made a product, or a, a preliminary product called the Gadget that literally like disassembles and reassembles <laughs> music mm -hmm. in real time yeah. to, to slow it down right. um, but the clicks and pops is guessing I, it's, it's tough. yeah okay I'm not I'm not saying go do it I'm just it's, I'm just curious uh, yes. no no Dave make it now this very second yeah. tell us the answer mm. no I, I, I think there's pro software stuff that does that I, I'm not very knowledgeable on it but. I've, I've heard about it, it it's mm -hmm. It's certainly something we could do. It doesn't sound like it's something we would do. Um, but yeah, the, the, some of the stuff the gadget does is insane. But that's... I could see it working in the digital audio work. The digital audio workstation thinks with a lot of software how it could probably do okay. I, yeah. A, a real-time one, I don't know. Yeah, like they're yeah. just working through the file and f fixing huh. those problems. But Yeah, I don't know. I would just say maybe buy a record cleaner. Yeah. Uh, there's partially that, but if the record's damaged, mm -hmm. then buy a new record. If it's super rare, yeah. You know, there's always there's always yeah. a use case, and you know how how deep does the rabbit hole go? It's like I I, I love it when you know um, you you literally can go as crazy as you want on pretty much anything uh, because you know take. Literally, take like coffee or whatever. I mean, you know, how much money do you want to spend? I mean, name. Buy, buy your own name, plantation. Yeah, it's name an insane plantation. number. I guarantee you can buy equipment and coffee that will strain your budget. Mm -hmm. um, and same with audio. You know, we tend to be on the lower lower end of things, which is pretty hilarious when, you know, you see a, a new MacBook Pro is going to be about the same price as a goon year, I'd, I'd expect. Yeah. Any plans for newer stuff for the gaming slash office folks? Hey. Lo love my hell. Would love some cross feedback and increased performance for playback. Ooh, he's going to like us. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but you're going to like us. Um, yeah, there's going to be some attention paid to that. And uh, one of them will be another product that uh, one of our fans suggested to me after I spent all the time doing Hell Plus and working out all the stuff with Hell and making it like dead reliable and more powerful and everything. This one guy goes, hey, have you thought about doing this with it? And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. I hate that. I don't know how many of you guys are in, you know, work in the creative field or engineering or whatever, but I'm sure you've had that experience where you, something you've worked on forever, you perfected, and some, you know, just random dude, you know, your cousin or, you know, some crazy intern off the street shows up and goes, well, what if you did this? And you're like, uh, yeah, it, it was like that. So, yeah, we're, we're working on the gaming side of things, and I think you'll really like what we're coming up with. I think we're kind of getting through most of the questions here. I'm getting some... It was an AMA thing, but, um, I mean... I'm surprised no one said, oh, you're going to Texas, so you're going to have, you know, everyone in, in like, you know, four by four cubicles and you'll whip them until they, you know, produce 4,000 magnes a day or something. It's like, no. You whip them anyways. <laughs> no. Regardless of how many they have. It's just part of the routine, I think. It's the morning wake up, right? Works much better than coffee, folks. Remember that. 
<laughs> well, you know, it's, it's that <laughs> adrenaline rush that, that gets you. Now, the, it, it is funny, though. Um, the, okay, there are, val there are valid concerns about employees. And what I can say is that, you know, everyone here can come to Texas if they'd like, and it's not like we're cutting their salary or anything. Um, you know, they all have an offer to, to come and, and work with us if they'd like. Some people will, some people won't. And uh, the benefits in Texas match the benefits here, even though it's not mandated. Texas does not, you know, say you have to have disability and certain things. So we just add it. That's what a rational employer does, you know, and that it's very common. There. So everyone who works for us there is very happy. Everyone who works for us here is, I, I le hope at least, fairly happy. And uh, that's, you know, that's up to us. And we play it pretty straight with our with our people. I think it's most things. No whips. Okay. No. That was only a joke. I just refer to you were saying like people in Texas tend to be polite. Yes. For a reason. Yes. So you might not want to. <laughs> no, it's yeah. it's not a great idea. It, it it's a it's a really interesting state. I was I was really uh, I assumed that when we first moved there, Lisa would, would say. Eventually, no, you know, it's neat. Don't know if I like it. Let's go back to California because she, you know, she's lived most of her life in California. I was born in California. And um, she's been the one who's like, hey, so when are you going to commit? And let's, let's go to Texas. So it, it is actually, despite the three months of complete insane weather, um, and the three months of we don't know how the weather's going to go. The other six months are fantastic. So there you go. So you're finally putting a ring on it then. Put Here we go, on. Texas. Boof. I have a Texas phone number now. Whoa. Yeah. No. Uh, and uh, yeah, we like I said, we are buying the buildings in Texas. We're you know, we are intending to be there for a good long time. Uh, any thoughts on bringing back the loudness circuit for your amps? Remember the loudness I actually, button? I, I like I like the loudness button. What did the loudness button do exactly? It applied a Fletcher Munson curve to the output. It basically boosted the treble and bass at low volumes to mimic kind of how you hear. Mm. I thought it was actually fairly useful. Um, the problem is you usually don't have the taps necessary on most modern pots to actually do that. We'd have to order a custom pot to do that. or uh, relay ladders, less said the better, probably, about the implementation on, on that one. Any plans for more Halo headphone amps? I don't know. Um, not at the moment. We're kind of seeing how it goes. Midgard seems to be going pretty well, and, uh, and Azure 2 is going well, so maybe. Uh, they would be single-ended amps, so you'd be looking at something like, uh, you know, a future Asgard or something like that. Uh, I don't have, I can't tell you about a future Asgard and haven't really, you know, decided on what we're doing with that. I'd love to make it a mini Mjolnir, but um, unfortunately all my efforts to do a mini Mjolnir have resulted in very bad amps. So uh, eventually maybe we'll get there. Is the Jotunheim due for any updates or changes soon? No, it's a, it's actually a very good amp and, and getting hard to improve. I'm hmm. I'm I'm playing with a couple of things, but they're kind of shots in the dark, uh, mainly centered around our our continuity um, implementation. One of them might be working, but I don't know if that goes in Jotunheim first. We gotta we gotta see where it ends up. Yeah. About it. Yeah. Anything you want to kind of close on, Dave? Anything? I mean, we always work on, yeah. You know, everything, we're, we're always kind of working on something. Uh, it's just that if I was working on Jotunheim, the chance that it changed in a year would be 50-50 at best. But right now we don't have any plans for it. Well, I think that's probably going to... Let's see. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably going to wrap it up. Okay. Everything else? Well... Hey everybody! Thanks for chiming in. I appreciate all the questions, and uh, I don't I don't know what the future is for the the streams, but I mean I think maybe there are you, you, there's some opportunity to get it done in Texas too, right? You ever, you've done one before. Yeah, we'll figure out something. I yeah. just you know I, I don't know 
I don't know a lot of the logistics. That's uh, you know Denise's thing. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we can make it work. Uh, I'm sure we will continue these, and I'm sure that we'll have a shitter. Uh, until then, it's going to it's going to continue on like this. Hmm.